Hello, everybody, and welcome to From the Same Crypt, a brother-sister podcast where we discuss and review books, preferably horror ones and other things that go bump in the night. I am Mikey. This is my sister, Sarah, and this is our official first episode. Technically, it's the third. (laughs) The first one we decided to do as a rough draft because it was real rough. The second one was great. And then it got misplaced somehow. So uh, yeah, third time's a charm. Um, And here we go again. So since this is the third time we'll be doing this, we'll keep introductions short and sweet. Hopefully, if you like us and stay along for the ride, you can just get to know us as the show progresses. Um, I'm Mikey, horror-obsessed fanatic. I am a co-host of a podcast called Slasher's Podcast. Um, that centers around movies and other horror media. So if that interests you, check us out over there. Um, and this is my sister, Sarah. Sarah, say something about yourself. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I loved reading in general when I was younger. So I picked it back up about a year ago. And I tend to have a bit of an addictive personality. So drugs. <laughs> yeah. But um, I probably read about... 30 books this year and I'm trying to make a face I actually don't know how many books I read this year I need to look because I do goodreads and it tra- keeps track I need to sign up for it so I know for sure yeah um but I'm trying to up it for 2024 yeah so I definitely need to keep track of it better um but I enjoy the genres that I enjoy are horror murder mysteries uh dark and regular romance and fantasy um as for horror in general our mom and my wonderful brother got me into horror movies at too young of an age this is true Uh, but now i'm always down for a good scary movie yes and we always like to mention uh one of my sister's first horror films at the theater was house of a thousand corpses when you were nine years old i did the math you were nine you're telling everybody sits. You didn't have much of a viewing experience because mom had her jacket over you the whole time, but she also didn't know what kind of movie it was. I was the one that made us go because I was waiting two years for it to come out because the movie took forever. Midnight premiere too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's what we do. It's the the family of horror, but it's funny because it's like mom likes horror, but she likes very much like hairy, like respectable, like horror movies. Um, I love trash. I love mean spirited, intense, extreme. Like I like all kinds of horror, but our mother, who we will refer to as the crypt keeper, if we're from the same crypt, she definitely has her limits. Mm-hmm. I don't. Uh, so Sarah had a good mixture of both. Um, we'll see what happens to my child. Yeah, we'll see. Olivia likes horror. She likes Krampus. I'm not careless. She's seven, so I don't show her everything. But um, we recently saw a movie called There's Something in the Barn. And um, I usually don't let her watch with our movies, but she was next to me doing her homework. And uh, she missed some days for being sick, so it was taking her a while. So I was like, just sit next to me. I'll help you as I watch this movie. But it really wasn't anything inappropriate. I think there was just like a little bit more blood than a PG-13 movie would allow. But it was basically about like, elves but they look like gnomes in the barn during a christmas season they were terrorizing this family it was kind of like an adult goosebump so it wasn't like anything that's gonna like mess her up but there was some parts where i was like "Mm, don't look (laughs) i know it's coming don't look um but hey we've all had those experiences when we were young um but yeah so um just to kind of (laughs) make up for the past two episodes and it doesn't feel like a waste of time for the books that we've read the first book or episode we did sarah j moss's court of thorns and roses and the court of mist and fury a quick little review of that sarah's obsessed she's finished the whole series um it's become one of my guilty pleasures and i'm excited to finish the next book or start the next book so when we record those we'll do a more in-depth review of that series and why we kind of put it in the horror genre, even if it's just has a little toe in. Um, but I think we're just fucking t- tired of talking about that 
for now. Um, <laughs> uh, we also read Vampires del Norte mm-hmm. uh, last, the second episode. Um, Sarah, what was your quick review of that again? Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, it kind of dragged on a little bit, but um, I probably wouldn't say it's one of my favorite like horror genre books, but it had it was a it was a different take on the vampire outlook, and I liked a little bit of the war aspect, and I liked the little romance in it, but it wasn't wasn't too crazy. Yeah. So, vampires del norte or of el norte, I can't remember what it's called. Um, I kind of connected with it quickly because it takes place right in our city. We're in Texas, by the way. Um, And this is about vampires in Texas, specifically around San Antonio, which is where we are. Um, We are half Mexican. Well, I'm half Mexican. She's quarter Mexican, quarter Puerto Rican, quarter other stuff. Um, So that was another thing that kind of connected me to it was just the Hispanic background and, you know, kind of being interested of how we texas became part of america because it goes over that um it was very horror light uh if i was going into this thinking it was just going to be a horror book i would be a little disappointed but i kind of knew it was going to be more of like a lifetime original presents the cool thing is the vampire (laughs) was the vampires were creatures they weren't Mm -hmm. romantic love interests which i always like better than the Everyone likes to say Twilight, but let's be honest, Interview with the Vampire did it too. Like all these people do it where they're sexy, they look human until it's too late, which I guess that's fine for some people. I prefer the monstrous ones like Nosferatu. Oh, speaking of, the next book we read was Dracula. <laughs> um, Sarah, give your little quick, I have a real quick review on that. Gosh, I did she not didn't finish it. Okay. <laughs> I did not finish it. Um, <laughs> It was boring. It was very boring for me. I did not enjoy reading it. And I like the story of Dracula. I just, and I enjoyed the way that it was written. Mm -hmm. I just didn't enjoy it. (laughs) Yeah. So similarly, I wasn't sure how I was going to feel because it takes place, the whole book is written in letters, like a letter to Mina or a letter from Mina to somebody, a letter from Jonathan to somebody. Um, But I actually really enjoyed that. It was different. It was unique. It made it go by faster and i really loved the first quarter when jonathan's at dracula's castle when dracula goes on the demeter which is what that movie the last voyage of the demeter is about and once they get into london i was i was done like it was boring it was i respect it for what it's done for vampire lore and the genre in general it's not that it was written badly. It's just maybe different time frames. You know, I'm a millennial. Are you a millennial or are you Gen Z? I think you're millennial. You're the young millennial. I'm the old millennial. Uh, I think our mindset's just a little different in terms of what entertains us, what keeps us invested in a story. And it just wasn't in Dracula. Um, I had to switch to the audiobook after halfway point because I didn't even want to finish it. But I was like, let me at least finish it while I'm doing my laundry. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, um, that's where we're on Dracula. Um, oh, yeah, Vampires of Del Norte. I finally gave it to mom. Oh, you did? Yes. Yeah. I was like, mom, I think you'll like this. So she's put it in her library and she's going to read it. So uh, we'll, we'll we'll get her review on that later. Yeah, it'll take a while. She takes some time to read books. <laughs> Surprisingly, I think she takes like she's faster than we think because she's read she's mentioned like reading like Nora Roberts type romance books and she reads them pretty quickly she just doesn't read often um depends on the content <laughs> yeah I guess uh and she's probably reading books that she doesn't show us because she's embarrassed um anyways bef- we'll uh, stop airing my mother's dirty laundry out um before we actually get into what we're reviewing this time um do you are you currently reading anything or have you read anything this month that you feel is worth mentioning um sure so this month i read hooked by emily mcintyre and then i followed it up with her scarred book um and i it's like a dark take i'm I'm sure a lot of you already know but it's like a dark take on like fairy tales like hooked was 
based off of like book from Peter Pan and they made it like more dark and, and adult like uh, but from the perspective of book and of course it's like it is it is a dark romance book but I enjoy that it's very gory <laughs> very is it gory. by Disney huh? is it by Disney no no it is well because Disney. Disney is doing these dark they're called dark something and they're like stories from the villain's perspective like there's one about there's one where it's about Ursula there's one about Maleficent I don't know if they're painting them as like anti-heroes but it sounds similar but that's interesting well for these like it really has very little to do with the storyline of the actual book they just use the similar names and sometimes similar events happen but they're not actually fairy tales like it's as if this is actually happening so they don't bring like like pixie dust in here is like oh. a drug called pixie dust <laughs> get it yeah um and i i enjoyed it it was okay but scarred i really enjoyed which was weird i didn't know how they were gonna do it it was that about scar from lion yeah oh wow i was joking no no it's from scar from lion King. <laughs> is it about lions no no oh. it's, but it takes place like in maybe like the 1890s so um hmm. so it's a little bit different i'd say it's a mix of like game of thrones yeah. in a way but it was really good i gave that one a higher rating than hooked um, well isn't isn't lion king kind of loosely based off hamlet i've heard that i can't I don't remember. To it. there's some william shakespeare story that it's loosely based off of so okay. it makes sense for it to be kind of that castle king and queen type yeah. story realm makes sense um, um really good. But yeah. currently reading tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and I know are those three books or is that one book? one book? Okay. Tomorrow and tomorrow. Yeah. Mom. Yes. Interesting. Thanks, Sarah. Um, oh, actually, before I forget, I need to start getting used to saying authors of the books that we read. So Vampires of Del Norte or El Norte. I actually should probably get used to doing the correct title as well. Um, Vampires of El Norte by Isabel Cañas. And as everybody know, Dracula is by Bram Stoker. Um, okay. So as far as what I'm reading, I read uh, something called Malevolent Nevers. I'm always supporting indie authors. Uh, the author is Tom Reimer. You can find him on Facebook. Um, his books, I, th- I he has a series of like three books that are related and then Malevol- Malevolent Nevers. And I think he just released a, another one. Um, he typically writes, I believe, fantasy-ish, but then also horror. Um, and his book covers, I like them. They kind of remind me of like 90s Goosebumps. Uh, they're just, they're like hand-drawn and cool. real cool colors. Um, but Malevolent Nevers was really good. I was surprised at how much I liked it, um, considering, you know, this is a very indie author but definitely check him out if you enjoy horror um and then dead 11 by jimmy juliano uh that was good very interesting um both books had a weird theme of like evil within a location so um but dead 11 it sounds like it's um an anthology but it's not like when i read the because we saw it at um uh what was it the our local bookstore nowhere books it mm-hmm. was there and i read it before i actually bought it i read the back and it made it seem like it was that it was an anthology but it's not um i'm not like i do like anthologies but i wasn't super into anthologies at i wasn't wanting to read an anthology if that makes sense um but it's not an anthology it's a full cohesive story highly recommend it um so following dracula we decided to stay in the 1800s because christmas is here and we decided to read a christmas carol by charles dickens Mm -hmm. have you read anything by charles dickens no actually not. have you heard of charles dickens before this yes did they make you read it did they make you read this in high school or middle school uh, is there another book that might have read in high school no right? i don't know they didn't make me read this i was just wondering because a lot of my friends read christmas carol in high school my friend's actually a high school teacher in florida right now um and even though they're banning everything they didn't ban a christmas carol uh so she makes her her seniors read it every year and charles dickens i don't know if i would know who he was if it wasn't for that movie matilda oh. because she reads yeah. She goes to the library and she always reads his books. 
but I've never read anything else by him. After these two books, I'm kind of like, I need to take a break of the super old shit. Let's get back to the new shit. Not saying it wasn't a good story. We'll get into it. But Christmas Carol is one of the most... Well-known stories? Not so much well-known story, but it's one of the most... It's a story that has been adapted into film or TV the most. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite adapt adapt adaptation? Um, I really like, because I like the graphics, um, of the one that... The Jim Carrey the Jim one? Jim Carrey one, yeah. I like the graphics. Is that one just called A Christmas Carol? Mm -hmm. I haven't, I, I haven't seen that one. I like how spooky they make, well, I guess we'll get into that, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, are you talking about the, so there's a podcast that we are uh, friends with on the Slashers podcast called Much Ado About Nerding. They review a bunch of just anything nerdy superheroes books horror movies and um it's funny because that they're a brother sister podcast as well and i was listening to it and i was like they're gonna think we stole this idea from them but we didn't and they mentioned that ad adaptation and how creepy they made the ghost of christmas past uh so i was like oh, i don't think i've seen that one um yeah i've seen like i don't know you were too young but there was a show called popular in the 90s which i didn't even realize was ryan murphy until like a couple of years ago because I was like what happened to that show I used to love that show and then I looked and I was like oh shit that was like Ryan Murphy like one of his very first things he did and for those of you that don't know Ryan Murphy does American Horror Story and Glee and uh, Feud all those shows my favorite adaptation is gonna have to be the Muppets <laughs> but there is a real dark one that I want to see I believe it's three entries so it's kind of long um, it's more horror-ish. It's on Hulu. It's called A Christmas Carol. And it has my celebrity crush, Tom Hardy, in it. I don't know who he plays. He doesn't play Scrooge. Yeah. Really about the movie or about Tom Hardy? Oh. No, Tom Hardy can get it, bitch. I mean, I was... Never mind. I agree. <laughs> He's a little short, so... That's fine. Don't matter when you're laying down. Just kidding. You're my sister. I'm not going to say about things like that in front of you. Um, I know. Okay. A Christmas Carol. When was it written? Because I forgot to look it up. <laughs> Never mind. She doesn't know either. 1800s. It's kind of, I don't even feel like we need to explain what it's about. Most people know what it's about. Yeah. It's really short. 160 pages. Hmm. Or at least that's what my copy was. I have one that looks like a little Bible. And I've had it for years. And I've always been like, I need to read it. Um, I believe the read through time. What do you think is faster, audiobooks or reading? I reading. Think reading is faster because yeah. audiobooks, I guess I read faster than I talk. Well, in audiobooks, they tend to draw things out. Because, mm -hmm. like, when I listen to an audiobook, I can listen to it on 1.5 speed and still understand everything. Oh, I hate speeding it up. No, I hate keeping it the same. I'm like, <laughs> um, same with people talking. <laughs> but uh, get to the point. Yeah, if I could do 1.5 speed to people, I would. <laughs> I would say it probably takes about an hour and a half to read it, and then it will take about three hours to listen to the audiobook. Mm -hmm. And I think this is public domain, so you should be able to just YouTube this and find it um, mm -hmm. if you want to listen to the audiobook. How do you feel about it? Well, again, going into it, knowing the concept of the story, um, it was kind of cool seeing like the original, what it was supposed to be. And, mm -hmm. I mean... There are adaptations that do a really good job at portraying it, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I listened to the audiobook, but I listened to it all past the audiobook, so it kind of felt it's like, like acted I, out. Yeah, I felt like I was actually just listening to a movie. Yeah. Um, and they even had like the sound effects too, it's like the wind. Oh. Yeah. That's cool. So it was it was good. That definitely took like three three and a half hours yeah. for audiobook, but I yeah, say I enjoyed it. Except I mean. The Christmas Carol, aside from Krampus, is like one of my favorite Christmas movies. Oh. So I enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed it. It was literally, I don't know if maybe it's because it's so short, mm -hmm. but like most adaptations hit everything. Mm -hmm. Um, there because you know, usually when you read a book that's based, like you've seen the movie or vice versa, you're always like, well, that wasn't in the movie. Um, <laughs> or the, yeah, like everything is pretty much there. It is interesting to just hear the the original descriptions of everybody. 
I never thought that when the ghost of Christmas present has the two kids under his robe, yeah. I never thought that was creepy. But when I read it, I was like, that's creepy. Um, and maybe it's because we've been watching these adaptations since we were in elementary school. You know, you watch, you're like, oh, that was cute. But like finishing this book, I was really like, oh man, like I get it. That's rough. Like I get, yeah. And I I had much more of an understanding of like the purpose of the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future. But again, I also haven't revisited the story since I was young and I wasn't asking these questions. <laughs> what was your favorite part of the book? Or if you had a favorite line, only because I have one and it stuck with me. Um, oh, favorite line. Let me get back on that one. I think I might think of it in a second because I remember a bit. But my favorite part is probably the iconic, like, climax of the story when Scrooge experiences his transformation after encountering the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Yes. Um, Never mind. I was going to get a tasteless death. joke. Go ahead. Mm. Uh, witnessing his own death. Like, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. This, this is it for me. <laughs> yeah. My favorite line, as far as parts go, I just, I, I love Christmas Future. Yeah. He's my favorite ghost. I was going to ask you what who your favorite ghost was. Me too. Me too. Yeah. He scares the shit out of everybody, <laughs> but he's my, like, that bitch don't play. Mm -hmm. And my favorite line is in the beginning when he's still an asshole. And he's talk, he's describing, he's either talking to someone or he's describing somebody. And he was like, it's more, he looks more gravy than grave. And I was like, <laughs> damn. I don't know if this is an insult back then, but here that I mean, you're calling him fat, which I think is what he was doing. But again, sometimes I'm not the smartest person and I could just interpret it incorrectly. So your favorite ghost was the future. Yes, actually, um when I was when I was a kid, we used to have like these cousin sleepovers at my uncle's house. And one of, you know, my cousin Jacob is really into film. Hi Jacob, he's my cousin too. Yeah. Thank you. Our cousin, our cousin Jacob. Jacob. He he's really into film, and we were like, I don't know, he was probably like twelve, and he wanted to record us acting out the Christmas Carol. Oh my god, how cringe! I know it was very cringe. I will bring it up. Oh. Roll the tapes. Roll the, I, we'll put it on the show. I'm just kidding. It's terrible, <laughs> terrible, terrible. Bunch of children dressing up, but. I drew, I thought at the time I drew the short stick because I played the Ghost of Christmas feature and I wore this big old black tarp and I was like, this is so embarrassing. And it was so fun. Yeah. <laughs> it was so fun being so creepy and making it work. So I related. I was in his shoes. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because it's almost like the three ghosts are like the three phases you go through when you're in trouble, when yeah. you're dealing with your parents. It's like oh. the first one's nice. The second one's like, I was nice before. You really need to shape up. And the third one's like when you're still not listening, and it's like, I ain't even gotta say anything. <laughs> I'm gonna point my finger. Um, but I was actually thinking I would really love to get a tattoo of ghosts past, present, and future on me. Um, because it's an iconic story, it's a good message, and really it just what it stands for. I love, because everybody's like, don't dwell on the past. Don't live in the past. But what I really liked about this book was it was like, no, like, you have to live in the past, but you also have to live in the present. And you also have to think about the future to get a full story of building who you are. And I was like, I like that. That shit's dope. Um, but with Ghost of the Future, yeah, that's a fucking X-Men movie. It always messes me up. I was going to say Go Ghost of Future Past. Um <laughs> And it's always because that stupid movie is, I've never even seen it, but that title is always stuck in my head. Um, the Ghost of the Future, I don't know if anybody's, if it's explained, but everybody seems to think it's death. Is the ghost, you don't think, actually, you know what? Let me ask Google. Is the ghost of future, oh, the first thing, death. The ghost of Christmas yet to come is said to be a personification of death. And like the future itself, the ghost of Christmas yet to come is unknown, mysterious, and silent. I also have a endearing thought of death. I'm not suicidal, everybody. Uh, I'm not emo. 
But uh, when you think about death, you think about the Grim Reaper. And I saw, I read something one time that was like, uh, death is, we all are afraid. We see this robed figure and whatever, whatever. Um, and everybody's always afraid of him. But he doesn't kill you. He's there to like escort you to your final destination. And it's kind of like a sweet thing if you think about it. Like if you're, regardless if you're spiritual, religious, whatever, whatever. I don't even, the Grim Reaper's probably not even real, everybody. Sorry, I'm just kidding. I don't know. Don't know. Um, <laughs> take that out. Um, <laughs> edit that out. Um, but if you're thinking about a, a, a entity that is supposed to be with you in your final moments before you reach your final destination, wherever that may be, it's like, I don't know. To me, that's a really beautiful thing. And... I don't know. It just, I think because everybody, humans in general, love, they love the concept of someone else dying. Um, you know, that's why we had the the fights with lions and the gladiator times. That's why executions were public. Like people, if there's one thing that brings people together, it's the concept of death. And so I think people like to look at the scary, ooky, spooky parts of it. But there's actually something, and there's actually like a, a thing going on right now. Um, called like a death positivity movement moment movement i don't know death positivity is a thing i'm not super immersed into it but basically they're trying to destigmatize because it's going to happen to everybody everybody's going to die um and it is it's a scary thing to think about leaving your people mm -hmm. leaving your family leaving whoever um so it, it's just it's a very interesting this is way off topic but it's on topic. I, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. I always kind of viewed it the same way. Yeah. And I and I think, and you know, a lot of people have the Grim Reaper tattooed on them. And it's always like, oh, I'm so hard. This is death. But it's like, no, like, it's actually like, it's a beautiful thing. And, you know, in a perfect world, in a fantasy world, if when I'm about to die, this hooded figure comes and it's like, hey, come with me. Almost like those memes where it's, or it's not a meme, but it's like a comic where like the dog dies and it's like have you been was i a good boy and he was like you were the best and he like takes him to heaven I was like, oh my god <laughs> i know um but i liked the book there was a small moment when i was like okay this is getting into dracula territory where i'm getting a little bit bored but it was quickly it was quickly erased that moment was erased um and i loved it and i think reading something is just more powerful i felt i felt jolly afterwards which is probably like the idea of the book um is this horror i think so i wouldn't say it's like one of the top level of horror but i think specifically with that moment with the ghost of christmas yet to come i i think at first it can be perceived as very scary especially how they describe him and how they describe the way that he's feeling and I mean I was hearing the wind and the <laughs> so she was into it yeah. I was into it um I think so a little portion but also it could be you know different things can scare different people um yeah. and maybe even just the concept of maybe the choices I am making currently in my life can yeah. result to this and that's pretty scary yeah I I I agree I think Horror doesn't have to mean I can't sleep at night. Mm -hmm. Horror can be something horrifying, even if it's just for the moment. And, you know, pretending we've never seen any adaptions, pretending we've never read the story, to kind of follow these otherworldly beings that are teaching you a lesson, and it ends with, you're going to die. This is your grave. Like, that's scary. And a lot of horror films have kind of taken that concept because it happens in quite a bit of, not even horror, other movies, where it's like, if you don't stop, this is where you're going. Um, so yeah, I I do think, even though this is, you know, we've been told this story since we were young, and we've been watching, you know, the Muppets did a version of this. It is, it it's a ghost story. To me, Christmas is the real Dia de los Muertos. We talk about Dia de los Muertos, it's starting to become popular in America, where you appreciate respect and acknowledge the people that have been around you and that's supposed to be the day that their spirits can come and like visit you and everything but I feel like that's Christmas because and I don't mean because it's like I don't know it's just when I for me the first thing I think about when I get in the Christmas spirit is what it was like when I was a kid 
because Christmas is so impactful when you're a kid and you think about, you know, we had a huge family when we were, I mean, we still have a big family, but when we were younger, we lived with, mm, well, when you were around, we had our own house, but when I was little, we lived with our grandparents and sometimes we had cousins that lived with us for a little while. And when we had Christmas, our grandpa liked to invite everybody. And so it was a ton of people, a ton of kids and you're with your cousins and, you know, the old ornaments were also kind of like toys. And I used to always get in trouble for playing with some of them. Um, <laughs> and then like, as the years go by and like new people come into the family, but then also people start fading away or passing away. And so when I think about how things used to be and Christmas is from the past, it's also being grateful and being mindful of the things that I have now, but also reflecting and mourning the things that we don't have anymore whether it's family you know anything that you have or the way things used to be but I I don't look at it as a sad thing which is weird I don't know an appreciation for having yeah yeah it's kind of like nostalgia like nostalgia isn't really a sad thing it's just kind of like you but you still get that feeling for a moment that you're with those people which is why I feel like in Christmas can be you know you know there's that line in that song about telling ghost stories during christmas and i was like maybe it's because the ghosts of our families are here <laughs> um but yeah so that is my wrap-up feeling for this book yeah. do you have any last words to say about a christmas carol yeah. unfortunately there was no one named carol in the book no. i don't know where that came from maybe it's because of the carolers you didn't like the carolers yeah. those bitches yeah um, but yeah, so before we end the episode, I wanted to just include a little bit of book news because I don't actually know of any avenue that has book news, but um, Clown in a Cornfield, there's one and two currently out. If you haven't read them, people seem to like them. I have both and I am very middle of the road with them, but I feel like I'm invested and I also appreciate that the main characters are gay. Well, not the main characters, but the main characters' friends are a gay couple and so but like you don't I it, it's okay a lot of books have gay people in them but the way that the first book kind of brought them out was great I don't it wasn't forced it wasn't like let's just add a gay character in here because you know we want to be PC it just worked and I loved it um the first one I did like the second one better than the first one there's a third one coming out am I excited no am I going to read it yes so um <laughs> but a lot of people really go for this book so if you like Young adult horror, Clown in a Cornfield is good for you. Uh, apparently, there's a Cujo sequel in the works. I don't know if it's going to be by Stephen King still, <clears throat> but it's coming. Um, and then it's Christmas time, so Silent Night, Deadly Night novelization is on its way. So according to some reviews, it's going to be pretty sick and twisted. Um, but yeah, that pretty much wraps up this episode. Um, a little sneak peek of what we're going to be reading next month. I let Sarah pick it because I figured we can alternate who picks books. And let's just say we're going to have a whale of a good time. I know I'm funny. Very excited. Anyways, hopefully you enjoyed the episode. Please like and subscribe if you want to hear more. And we will come back to you next month with another review of another book. Until then, hope everybody has a good holiday and we will see you later. Say bye. Oh, bye. Oh, goodness. <laughs> bye. Thank you.